we have a very important person in the front of the room, and it's not me. So it is, uh, it is a real privilege uh, and an honor to have you join our community. So we have with us today, uh, I'm sure uh, all of you know this, uh, Elisa Villanueva Beard. And, um, and so uh, CEO of Teach for America, I'm going to go very quickly through uh, went, went out of college, first job was Teach for America, 1998. Yep. Three years later, leader of the Rio Grande region for Teach for America. Four years after that, the COO of Teach for America. Uh, it then took all of eight years to become the co-CEO, and then two more years to become CEO, and you've been CEO since 2015. And so an incredible trajectory, uh, unusual both for the fact that she stayed with the same organization for those years, but also unusual because of the speed of the ascent. Now, what all of you may not know is that, that we are lucky that this happened because she chose not to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> so That's true. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, a little known fact that she let me know is she actually grew up a huge Duke fan. So, uh, so here she is at home. <laughs> so please welcome Elisa. <laughs> So uh, you, you've talked about resilience, and, uh, and I know a little bit about your experience coming, coming from uh, Texas and then going to college in the middle of Indiana, very different environment, and feeling like this, this wasn't going to work for you. So what was, what was it about you that gave you the resilience to, to get through that experience where you were struggling so much? And obviously, it was worth it given everything that followed from that. But, but what's, the, what's the secret to building resilience? Hmm. Such a good question. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think what I would say is I would start with my family. I grew up in um, the border town in South Texas, McAllen, Texas, about 10 miles north of the Mexican border. My mom is an immigrant from Mexico. She came to the U.S. at the age of 17, and my dad's family is also from Mexico. And so um, ensuring that I got a great education and went to college was a goal that my mom in particular had of me and my siblings. That was, she just said, you're going to go to college no matter what. And my parents sacrificed so much to ensure that we had everything we needed. And so I ended up at DePauw because of a mentor and to you know, the point you just made, um, I struggled mightily my first semester and it was a shocking experience and quite traumatizing because I was an A plus student. I was, I'm an ambitious, like very goal oriented, very disciplined kid and did everything right and then realized maybe I'm not cut out for this, is what I started to internalize. And I actually didn't know if I was going to make it. What got me to be resilient, I, I called my mom about three months into it, and I told her that I didn't think I was going to make it, that I didn't think I could do it. And my mom let me talk for a few minutes and then said, you're not welcome home <laughs> until you complete your degree from DePaul University. You chose it, and you got to now do it. And I, I reflected with her on this question. That moment was really hard for me because I, I thought, she doesn't understand. I don't know what else to do. I'm literally doing everything in my toolbox to succeed, and it's not working. Um, but my mom said, I knew you could do it. And that's why I said that. I knew you could do it. You can do anything. And, and she was right. <laughs> and so I, 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 I think what got me through that moment was... I had to just believe that my mom was right um, and that I could do it and believe in myself that I just was going to have the breakthrough. And it was really hard, you all. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced, but it's really traumatizing to go from an A-plus student who's really successful. I was student body president. I was an all-star basketball player. So all I knew was success. And now I like couldn't find my footing. And, I, and very few people look like me at the school that I was at, too. So I was starting to internalize all those sorts of things that are not helpful. Um, and so that was a very 
big resilient moment for me. And I have found I come back to that moment a lot because I'm like, I know I can do it because I, it took a lot in me to ask for help. I learned how to ask for help at the age of 18. Um, I learned how to say, I don't know how to do it. I need help. Um, and that was a big leadership lesson. And I just learned I got to keep showing up. I got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and making myself do it. And then I had my breakthrough. Um, and then I, was, I thrived. I did really, really well after that. And, and then that made me sort of mad um, but because I started to realize I always had the capability to do it. But I, I wasn't prepared for that, and that's not fair. Um, and it is what sort of set me on my trajectory. I was going to be a lawyer, and, and then I got yeah, so So is it safe to say that, that this experience actually motivated you to, uh, to kind of make up for what you didn't receive that, that put you in this position and therefore join Teach for America? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I wanted to be successful, and I was going to be the first attorney in my family, and that was a big deal for my family, so I was very focused on that. I was still processing that first year in college, and what got me to sort of sweat me off my feet was my sophomore year, end of the year, I uh, was sitting in, on a porch uh, swing, and Carla showed up, and she had graduated from college two years before that, and I had met her right as she was leaving, and I really admired her. She was an econ major. She was a hardcore field, field hockey player, um, and I started to ask her, you know, how is it post-college? What are you up to? And she started to tell me that she was teaching in South Phoenix. And this woman just lit up about what she was up to and the belief she had in her kids. And she started to tell me about all of the challenges that her kids have and what her mandate is. And I remember listening to her in awe and thinking, this woman will literally tear down walls for her kids. And then I came to understand, like, there was, you know, she was part of a group of people who were really determined to work with their kids and families and other educators to ensure that we delivered the education our kids want. And I remember thinking, I want to be part of that team of people who cares that fiercely, will literally not give an inch for what is possible and are all in. Um, and that's what got me to join Teach for America. My mom was devastated, by the way, but um, <laughs> she got over it. <laughs> so so have, have, has your family come to grips with you being a CEO instead of a lawyer? <laughs> they have. <laughs> okay. Everyone's resolved. OK, good. So what's interesting is you, you then you taught for three years I did. before you uh, kind of as I went through the, 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 the steps in your career you decided to take on a, a leadership role in, in helping run the Rio Grande region. Uh, what was it that motivated you to switch from being in the room with the kids to this different kind of platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved teaching, um, and I was, pretty, I was good at it. Um, I really, really enjoyed it, and, and, I, and it really did deepen my passion and commitment to working towards educational equity and excellence. I still keep in touch with some of my kids, by the way, um, and, and just loved every second of it. The thing that I started to get a little bit anxious about was um, I taught second grade my, for my second and third year, and my observation was, A, the school was really was not doing well. We would lose 60% of our teachers every year. Um, by my second year, I was a veteran, <laughs> and I was the grade level chair at my second year of teaching. Um, and there was a permanent sub in third grade every year. So my kids, I'd have them, they'd go to a permanent sub, and then we also had a permanent sub in fifth grade and in sixth grade and in, in, in the other years. And I was just sort of watching the whole system and saying, how are my kids going to make it? You know, um, how is this going to work over time? And a teacher really can have a transformational impact on kids. I do think really get them to believe in themselves and, you know, the impact that you do have that year matters. But it's really hard if you don't sort of get what you need the next year and the year after that. And so I was getting, you know, a little bit um, discouraged by that. I thought I was going to be a principal. So I started to say, maybe I'm, I'm going to go get a degree to be a principal because I think principals change communities. I still believe that, and maybe one day I'll do that. Um, but what got me to join Teach for America or to, to become the executive director is I'm really passionate about my community, and I was watching what was what TFA was able to contribute in my context, and I was motivated to want to 
better work at a systems level where I could see the interaction of all of the systems that interact in the education system. Our kids don't live in vacuum, so they're impacted by all of the inequities that they face. You know, when we talk about um, food insecurity and housing crisis and medical crisis, like all of that impacts education. And you start to see that as a teacher and you start to understand, well, how is all this working together to help our kids, wrap our, our arms around our kids fully? Um, and so I was motivated by that. I didn't pursue the executive director job, by the way. That wasn't sort of, I like set my eyes on that. Instead, I was doing really well in the classroom and the chief operating officer for TFA at the time found me and sort of, you know, convinced me and had to sort of convince me because I'm like, wait, I have to fundraise, I have to manage people, I've never done any of those things. I was definitely underqualified for this job in some ways, but he believed in me and I said, well, if he really believes I can do this, maybe I can do it. And so I took the leap and, and I did really well. <laughs> um, and I loved every second of it. It was like a, the greatest honor to be able to serve my community in that way. Yeah. So I want to I want to flip from your personal journey to the 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 strategic ambition of Teach for America. Yeah. So people uh, who aren't familiar with TFA may not know that there's both short run goals in terms of the impact of your uh, your core, but also long term goals. Before I get to the long term aspect of this. The short term, which is what most people focus on, is you're putting teachers in these classrooms. And of course, you've heard this critique probably a million times, which is how can you really change things if you have people coming in and they're only in that community for a couple of years? So tell us about what the short term goals are and then why that critique hasn't stopped you. OK, yeah, great question. Um, I, I do want to make sure folks understand the context of, of with which Teach for America exists and our own understanding of the problem and then the solution that we are a part of. Um, so we know that educational inequity is a major systemic issue and it's, takes a, it's going to take a lot of interventions to take that on and we're fully clear-eyed about that. Um, and our focus and our contribution is leadership, exceptional leadership, equity-oriented, purpose-driven leadership. That is who we are, have been recruiting to do this work for you know, over 33 years now. And so the idea here is that we get folks who want to channel their energy and their leadership to have an immediate impact to really get, like, None of us are winning if literally kids are locked out of opportunity just because of where they happen to be born. That is fundamentally un-American. That's fundamentally against the very values of what our country says we stand for. And none of us can sort of rest with that understanding that like literally we're, because you happen to be born here, this is like your life trajectory versus if you're born here. That's just wrong. And so we're saying let's bring incredible leaders to work alongside many others doing really good work to have an impact. And we have learned over time, our theory was, you know, could 22 year olds largely, that's largely, you know, we recruit right out of college and about 25% of our core are early on in their career, um, be successful in this endeavor when we're placing them in urban and rural America with places of great need. The height, the bar is very high for us to succeed in this context. And we accept that responsibility. And, um, and we've seen over time that our teachers do have a positive impact, that the demand for Teach for America continues to grow because of the impact. And we do principal surveys every year. And, you know, so, and we ask, how are our teachers doing? Are they having the impact that you expect them to have? Do they impact your, the culture of your school in positive ways? And the last survey we just did about 18 months ago, I mean, the, the scores are really high, high 90s, like positive, positive, positive. And so we have enough feedback from principals, from students, our own data and research on the, you know, our teachers doing right by kids that keeps us on the mission. But it doesn't end there, right? Like to the point of like, it's not just about that. The whole idea here for us is that getting into the classroom literally changes the hearts and minds of adults too. Because a lot of us read about inequities that exist. And I'm from a community that, you know, I went to a school where we place core members, but it's different. When you're the adult 
in the classroom who's very privileged now because you have a college degree, you have benefits, you're getting a steady salary, whether it's good enough or not is a different question. We talk about that. Uh, but you, you, are, you are in a position of privilege when you are teaching kids who are in the environment, the conditions that they are. And it, it's a deeply visceral human experience because you know your kids can do it. That, that's the hardest part for me. It makes me very upset over and over again because your kids are just as smart as any other kid. We, we know that for a fact. They literally just don't have the access and opportunity. And so when you watch your kids succeed and you learn to love your kids, you love your kids, you love your families, you love your community, and you see all the inequity, you sort of just can't live the same. You don't see the world the same way. Um, and there is, maybe you had a tiny fire in your belly when you joined TFA, maybe you had a big fire, but it is catalytic and continues to, to burn and put you on a mission to do something about it. Whether it's staying in the classroom or working outside of education, we need incredible purpose-driven leaders leading systems at every level of an ecosystem. So you have 60,000 plus alums okay. who, who've done this, and um, uh, quite a few do stay on in education in, in some fashion. Uh, others may go to business school and choose another path. Um, but one thing that's really remarkable is these people have a sense of optimism, having, having gone into environments that may not reveal the best of this country and the best of our education system, it makes them more optimistic that we can actually solve these challenges. How, how is that happening? Is there, is there a support system that, that people talk to each other and gives them this optimism or do they just know they've gone in and they could make a difference and therefore it's possible to make things better? Mm, yeah. You know, I don't know if I can answer the question, like I don't know for sure how alums end up processing and, and orienting that way, but the data I, we do have and our understanding of what people experience is we're obsessed with our teachers building deep connection with their kids and being successful. Because you then see, you know, of course it's a classroom, it's not a whole system, but the point is if you're able to see other human beings who deserve to succeed and have choice like anybody else, you're like, wait a minute, there's nothing inherent in the problem here. There's nothing that we can't fix about it because no one's broken here. No one's inherently unable to succeed. And so you're like, God-given potential isn't being realized just because of <laughs> systems we've designed or kids are a part of. And that's really hard to reckon with. Um, and so because you, my, my optimism comes because I know our kids can do it. I, I don't give an inch on what is possible. I mean, you hear over and over, well, the data says, and the pattern is, yes, thank, yes, data's important, thank you for the patterns. And we're in the business of disrupting probability. That is all we orient to at Teach for America. We reject the probability that this is the, this is the curve. Well, what is it gonna take to break that curve? because our kids deserve that. And we, we created this, we can, we can change it. And I believe in the power of people to like make a different choice. It literally is people deciding something different, having a different possibility and a different vision. That's all that's ever helped us make progress in our history in our country, is people just rejecting that this is just the way it is. It's not just the way it is, and it's not okay that this is the way it is, and we're just never gonna give on that. And so you, so, and I, and I do think it comes back to like that deeply human experience and that proximity. It's no longer theoretical. You, you no longer are like these aren't numbers. These are faces. These are lives. These are real people that you deeply care about, and you can't remove yourself from that. So going from that note of incredible optimism to the the crushing reality of COVID. Yeah. Uh, COVID was devastating to public education in this country. Um, and yet, you remain optimistic. And, uh, and I think one of the things that, that you're actually optimistic about is you believe that we need to completely rethink education. And so is this a moment where COVID has been so disruptive that we can rethink 
how we deliver education in public schools in a significant way. I do believe that is available to us. And I do believe that that's honestly the only way we're gonna get on a different trajectory because I think the system has run its course. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how we get out of the crisis we're in without deep innovation and re reinvention. And I, and I think what I'm observing is folks are finding themselves in real binds. Like, you know, and, and folks are making different choices. I, I just, in Texas, we just, 30 districts are moving to a four-day school day um, starting next year. Kids need six days of schools, not four days of schools. So you're starting to see, you're like, how is that going to work? That is only gonna set kids back. But you're finding other folks saying, all right, we have to teach kids chemistry. There's no choice. So I'm gonna start to really think about what's available to me with technology to be able to deliver for kids. And you start to realize, oh, you can think about the teacher role differently. If you're having someone zoom in with this content knowledge, you need someone else doing something different in the classroom. Learning will always be a deeply human experience. Like there's no way to do this without uh, carrying adults around you, but there's different ways to actually organize yourself. And I think people are having to force themselves into that reality. Um, and we, we have to start to figure out how, to we, how do we incentivize more of the innovation? Because right now the observation is there's so much pressure on the system everyone's in fight or flight mode. Our kids are not well. They are not well academically. Kids are not reading at grade level. We lost two decades of progress in two years. One in 360 kids lost a parent or a caregiver during COVID and it mostly disproportionately impacted kids of color and kids in low-income communities. Teachers are not well. They're being asked to do more with less. Um, they are not paid adequately. And so 50% of teachers, you all, over 50% of teachers have a second job. And by the way, they're working about 52 hours a week on average. How can anyone really get out of a fight or flight mode and be available to teach and learn and be creative when you're in that kind of position? And so if we start to lean in to understand technology, which you know we can talk about AI and the wave of AI that has arrived and we are unprepared for that, um, in our education system. And while there's huge opportunity, ability to personalize, give access to learning and feedback, I mean, huge, huge opportunity, there's also massive risk, massive inequity, ethics questions um, that come with this that we're just not managing well enough and it's here and it's gonna go fast. Um, but there are also tools that, you know, we're discovering at Teach America are really helpful that are helping our teachers learn and grow AI-enabled tools that we're testing. Um, and that helps to reinvent, helps us, help us think about, you know, how do you center the student in a system and start to think about how to, how to move a different direction altogether. So the, um, you know, one of the, one of the really devastating consequences of, of COVID in, in public schools was the, the digital divide, which has been well known yep. for years and years, became a digital chasm. Um, did did we actually respond in positive ways where where we were forced to remediate some of those issues? So did we manage to lessen that digital yes. divide um, through COVID? And, and then if we have better access to technology, how do we think about something like chat GPT unlocking the potential of your of your teachers to have more impact? Mm -hmm. I do think we made huge progress on the digital divide. There are still some communities that literally don't have access to reliable internet, and you still have certain communities, especially our rural communities, who remain locked out of it. But we made massive progress, and we just have to see all the way, see that all the way through. Um, what I will say is, people now have access to devices by and large, but then how to use them appropriately, how to ensure teachers are trained and comfortable using it as a tool, ensuring kids actually also are getting the most of it is a place that, we're, that we've got to work on. And as we think about all the tools available through technology, ensuring that they are, you know, really are, are co-designed with students, really considering all the populations and diversity of kids that we are 
trying to reach and the product is really being developed to reach all kids, I think is a big question. And then on chat GPT, I mean, this is a good example. When I say we are under unprepared for this, there are districts who have forbidden chat GPT to be used in their districts. Um, New York City is one of them. Oakland just decided this. And I mean, colleges are saying we're, we're prohibiting this um, and from kids using it. The problem is the kids have access to it. You can't, they're, they're going to, they're going to use it. They're, they're, and by the way, when we say don't do it, they're going to go do it and they're, they're, they want to learn about it. And there is opportunity in it, um, but we're not managing it. Instead, we're trying to control, which is you know, what I'm most worried about. Um, and at Teach for America, what we're doing is really figuring out what's our strategy with, with AI. And as I was alluding to earlier, we are actually using some of these tools. I was telling a group earlier um, we are using a tool called TeachFX right now that we're piloting with a group of our core members. And essentially this tool gives speed feedback to the teacher on student engagement. So it is giving the teacher real-time feedback on how much this teacher's speaking, how much the students are speaking, what students are speaking, the quality of the questions, and the teacher's able to respond to that. And it's led to like 88 in increase, 88% 88 increase in student engagement which is huge, and teachers are saying, like, this is hugely helpful. There's a lot of tools like that can, that actually can help us in accelerating our effectiveness and efficiency in, in reaching kids that I'm interested in continuing yeah. to learn about. And, and it may be that we're going to have to have our teachers be more efficient and effective Absolutely. because we have fewer of them. So uh, an astonishing statistic that we lost 600,000 teachers in public schools between January of 2020 and February of 2022, you are not immune from, from that, uh, that decline. I think that your, your most recent uh, recruiting class had about 2,000, which is a third of the size of what you had 10 years ago. Uh, so so how, uh, how can you rebuild the human capital side of this? Yeah, so... Um... This is obviously a big focus um, for us. And the whole context over COVID, I mean, just deeply challenging. And as you all can imagine, we just shared a bunch of statistics. You're like, and come teach, you know, defer going on this lucrative, you know, pathway and, and come teach. The truth is we really do need people to choose this because we need this generation of young people who are digital natives, who see the problems, but see solutions very differently to be really energizing the system with creativity and innovation working alongside others. Um, but we've had to ourselves really pivot. I mean, we've been around for 33 years. So there's something about, you, you all are familiar with like the phases of an organizational life. Your first decade for us was like proof of concept. Second was scaling. And we scaled really fast, 18% compound annual growth rate for 13 years straight. Um, and then through all of this, we have different generations. TFA was built by and for Gen Xers, my generation. We had, you know, millennials, and now we have Gen Zs. And there are different conditions and interests of every generation and expectations that folks have um, that we are having to adapt. And then you have the conditions of the system of what we're asking people to do. So um, this is our first year back on campus. You know, we, so we were recruiting virtually. So imagine trying to do this body of work over Zoom and inviting people to join us at events at Zoom, but never actually having the human connection extremely difficult to do well. Um, and we're back on campus. And what I find is that we have a generation that cares so deeply about the world, about solving systemic inequity, about justice, about systemic racism, wants to be in the arena. That is what we observe. And that is, I, that is what's true. I think this generation doesn't change the world. And we have a system that we're inviting them into, you know, that's tough to say yes to. And so we're trying to figure out how can we bridge that. Um, and so we've done things like have to invest significantly in grants and transitional you know, um, dollars to help people not have costs and salary be a barrier to entry. And we're really committed to that. So I'm spending about $15.8 million on that alone um, because we have a generation that's graduating on average with $30,000 of debt. 
um, with lots of pressure and a, a need, cares a lot about justice, but also like financial stability is a stressor when you don't have that. And that's, a, that's an important, fair calculation for people to have. And so we're trying to do all that we can to lower those barriers to entry. So I've had to adjust and do things like that. And then also just how we deliver our program. We're in the process of modernizing and transforming how we deliver our program um, to be digitally enabled, to really take advantage and be on the cutting edge of training and supporting teachers with the best in class assessment, access to content, coaching, mentorship, um, and able to, to pivot into that. So we're in the process of, being, of, of moving and doing the work in that way, um, really guided by a big 2030 goal that we set pre-COVID that has actually been really important for us to keep our eye on the prize. And that 2030 goal is rooted in a pathway to economic mobility for the kids and communities that we serve and double down you know, in serving um, and ensuring that we are really accountable to our communities. So we're saying we wanna be held accountable to real change and able to drive the change needed um, as a true strategic talent partner to our schools and districts because we have core members, we have alumni, we actually now have tutors that started through COVID. Um, and have really organized ourselves in this way. And so are just, this is the moment that TFA has to fully show up. I'm like, we were built to show up for this moment. So we got to make sure we're making our greatest impact. So we're making some big moves in order to organize our, ourselves to do that. Yeah. So I'll come back to that, but uh, just slight digression. One of the okay. things I've heard you say is we have to pay our public school teachers more. And uh, I don't know if you saw that the, the governor in North Carolina proposed that the teachers, public school teachers, get an 18% raise. Um, some of the reactions to that were quite negative. Yeah. And so my question is, why is it in this country that we don't believe that we should compensate teachers at a reasonable level? What, what is the, what is it? that you've figured out that we need to fight against to be able to pay, pay teachers fairly for something that is so profoundly important to society's well-being. Yes. Here's what I, uh, my personal view on, on this is, I, the teaching profession is not a respected profession. You often hear, you know, you go teach when you can't figure out what else to do. You don't recruit and I'm, I'm talking generalizations and, you know, I don't believe any of this, um, but I think people think this is not where your ambitious, whoever, lawyers, doctors, social entrepreneurs, this is not where they're going to go. Um, and so I don't respect it as much. There's not clear accountability. There's not, it, it, you know, I, it's not a rigorous culture or way of working. Um, there's pensions, there's, you know, all the incentives of a system are unlike how businesses and well-run companies often work. And I think that's sort of how I think Americans orient. My belief is that the system is designed a certain way and it incentivizes and it produces what it's designed to do. I believe the people largely work and the system doesn't. That's just like deeply what I believe. Um, and we don't invest in our educators. We don't set the expectations of what we need and want. Um, we don't have a strong learning, rigorous culture, but we could. I mean, you could actually do that. And so my, I just think it's completely unreasonable, unjust, to ask teachers to do what they are doing in any form that's like somewhat productive <laughs> when they literally cannot make ends meet. I mean, they are, uh, these are real stories. They are crying. They're so stressed out about, they can't pay for daycare. They can't pay for gas. These are not exaggerations. This is reality. And I think that's just wrong. Like you can't even begin to figure out a way forward when you're not even treating people humanly, fairly. Um, and so the lever to student success is the teacher in this, paradigm that we have right now. And so if we want to get on a different trajectory, we got to free ourselves up to like create the space to be innovative, create different incentives, start to support people in a different way. Um, and so that's my 
my view on it. And I just think it's it's so important and, and it's shocking how we cannot get this right. Yeah. So I want to come back to where where you were headed, which is having to do things differently within TFA. And uh, you're you're not for profit, but at the same time you can't run you can't run a persistent deficit. You you have to have that business dis discipline. Um, and COVID, of course, was was a, a real issue. And so it's been announced uh, just in the last couple of months that you're going to reduce your staff by 25%. So tell me, what, what leadership skills have you had to invoke to get through this time of, of contraction, retrenchment, without losing the sense of optimism and possibility that comes yeah. with TFA? So I would not call it at all like contraction. Um, here's what I would, here's how I, the context I would provide for it is I mentioned the 2030 goal that we set and we set that in 2019 right before COVID. And that goal was set because as we were reflecting on being almost 30 years old, we were asking ourselves, what changes happen in the communities? We've been in some communities who are almost 30 years old. Are kids on a different trajectory altogether? We've invested billions of dollars in our work over 30 years um, of, of investments that have been made to us to deliver um, on social impact and good. And we definitely see progress and points of progress. But when you look at the whole community or whole system, kids in an entire district, you're like that, not necessarily that is moving in the right direction. And and in our dashboard was green. We're raising the money. You know, our teachers were their student data. Our teachers are doing are delivering the goods. They're you know, if you're going to hire a first year teacher, TFA is the best bet to go. You know, we have all this data. We have a green dashboard. But then the kids overall, you're like that's not changing. And so we wanted to really have be held like ourselves accountable to our communities and say we're going to set this big 2030 goal that requires us to do work fundamentally differently. And we knew that. And we also were, I was starting to realize, like, we also have to have a system that's more agile, um, that is able to, the world around us is changing so fast that you've got to be, like, really obsessed with the front lines, understanding what the needs are, and being able to move fast enough. When you're an organization that's been around, like, scaled, I don't know if you all have read the book Founders Mentality, but that's a book I go back to over and over again. Chris Zook wrote it, and I'm forgetting his last name. Alan is his last name. I'm forgetting his first name. Um, but their thesis is scale creates complexity, and complexity is the silent killer of scale. And essentially, as you become so, when you're a startup, you move fast, you manage risks, um, you are obsessed with the front lines, you know, you take calculated risks that sort of take advantage of opportunities. And as you enter the life cycle of being more at scale, bureaucracy emerges, you're not obsessed with the front lines, um, you know, you're more risk averse, you miss opportunities, you're less innovative. And so it's sort of a, a natural life cycle of an organization. And so for us, I was realizing like, we just have to get flatter, we've got to be able to be more agile, and we have to take advantage of the digital and technology that's available to us, given the generation we're dealing with. And we have to modernize so much of the way that we do work. That was starting to happen pre-COVID. COVID hit, and we were able to accelerate some of that work because we had to go digital, virtual, summer training that we've been, been building on. So we've been doing a lot of testing of these ideas over the last two years, and for many reasons have like you know wanted to test things before we do full scale. Um, and we're at a point now where we're just saying, we got to get to the other side of this transformation and so are and have learned a lot that we're just putting to work and so you know what's driving our transformation is the need to deliver the greatest impact for kids and the way to work has to change and so here we are it's the hardest thing to do i have the best staff at teach for america who are the most impact driven folks so it's really hard to have to lead through the disruption of real lives, you know, it's so, so the hardest, most difficult thing that I'm leading through. Um, and we are an organization that is rooted in, in impact and have to let that guide us and be accountable and also hold our people who we love and are part of our community um, as we do it. And that's what we're in the middle of. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question, okay. which is actually a two-part question, and then I'm gonna turn it over okay. to the audience to ask questions. So, uh, so the first part of the question is, um, what is it about your leadership capabilities, your style, the way you interact with others that got you noticed? Uh, because you, you know, I, I've said this now two times already, this is the third time, you had an incredibly rapid ascent into the, the top spot of, of the organization. So what got you noticed? Um, and then the second part is, as we think about the people in the seats here, what do you notice? So what, what do they need to think about that will get them noticed mm -hmm. and allow them to also have the opportunities to, to move up and advance in their organizations? So I think to your first question on what got me noticed is not trying to be noticed. <laughs> it, like just getting the work done. Um, I'm an impact driven person. So, you know, I just want to like deliver the goods. And, um, and so I, I, I'm a collaborator. So I will ask for help. I'll pull other people in because I'm trying to, to deliver the thing. Not it. And so decentering me in what I do has probably been my, the, the style that I have um, is being clear on what I want to accomplish, but it not being about me in the process. And I think that has been a thing that at least has been played back to me um, in, in how I work. And so I, I've, I've just been successful at the things I've committed to doing. And that's what gets, I think, a person noticed who's also able to work with others and you know, people <laughs> like spending time with it, make, make it, you know, joyful. Um, and so that's what I would say over time if I look at, if I look at the pattern um, and, and then sticking with it, you know. Um, when things get hard, I lean in, I don't lean out. Um, in the hardest of moments, I run towards the fire, never away from it. And I think that gets you noticed too, is when you are, you know, you really figure out what you're made of and what your organization is made of when you're going through the hard stuff. And that's when folks emerge as like, wow, these are um, servant leaders who just wanna have an impact, who like literally are putting that first and that's what's most important. Um, and I think that that really matters. And, to, and so that, that would be my observation to, in terms of like my advice is stick with things long enough to learn. <laughs> You know, so often now I'm watching folks like I, I'm going to do something for a year or two. That's really hard to like have really instructive lessons about your own leadership, how you manage through things you don't understand are really hard, your own failures, because you will have that. It's inevitable. Um, and you want to learn the right lessons from that. You don't you want to believe like, oh, I, I, I can tell the story of where I was, how I got through it and how I'm at the other end, and then it's complete, and you can sort of move on. And, and truly, you know, I, I like people. I'm, I'm an ambitious person in that I want to have my great, greatest impact, but I never, I never thought or wanted to be the CEO of Teach for America. That was never my ambition. It was more of just that that's sort of what happened. The doors opened as I, you know, was successful in the trajectory that I was on um, and could build the teams around me to help me do that. Okay. Yeah. So, questions from the audience. Thank you for speaking with us, Elisa. This was absolutely great. Um, I'm a former teacher. I know there are many in the room, uh, but we're all moving, uh, or most of us are moving into some form of the business community. So I'm wondering, in terms of partnerships with the business community, what does partnerships look like beyond funding? Are there new programs, partnerships, initiatives that TFA plans to scale up as you redesign the community? With businesses, I will say a lot of it is um, what what ends up happening is we will enter some kind of um, funding, you know, partnership. But then we're able to really engage those corporations into the work of Teach for America. So more and more, we're finding folks want to actually get proximate to the work. They want to volunteer and be helpful in classrooms um, and things of that nature. I will say a thing that's been really helpful for us at TFA is when we get pro bono consulting. So we have a few consulting firms that reach out to us and say, hey, we really want to be helpful. What's your hairiest, biggest strategic 
issue. Um, and that actually has really helped us get through some of these, like be able to quickly move and get into action on some of our, our big strategic questions that we're always extremely grateful for because those are services we could never, we would never probably, we just wouldn't pay for. Um, so that's more of, and then that's, that's what comes to mind. And then I will say um, we are testing on ed tech companies, for example, um, partnerships in helping to train and support our teachers. We're being very careful. Everything has to be research backed, you know, a focus on equity on how folks are developing their products. And, you know, and, and we do a lot of, um, are very disciplined in, in that process of due diligence. Um, but that's more of what we're also starting to explore um, in partnerships and different ways of waking, working together and then including those folks in brain trust and, and ways and efforts to allow us to accelerate our own thinking and impact and strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much for chatting with us. I've really, really enjoyed this. I was really struck, you were talking about the, um, you were chatting about how students um, are impacted by teachers and something that's like really struck me in that realm um, and in the realm of like pursuing and being interested in becoming a teacher myself um, is that being at a school like Duke, I remember telling peers, I was like, hey, I think I'm interested in being a teacher um, and having a peer tell me, you know what, aim higher, like how about investment banking, how about something like that? And so I, I'm wondering, as you're looking to recruit people, I mean, obviously you're looking for people who are impact oriented, but the cultural situations that students are in affect their pursuits a lot um, as well. So considering that kind of what is your pitch as you're trying to recruit these students um, to become teachers in TFA, kind of how are you going about making teaching cool and making it attractive um, for them? Here's what I would say is we are living through a historic time in this country. Like really, this is, a, this is not dramatic. It is, we are in an inflection point as a country. We are at risk of leaving an entire generation behind. And that doesn't work for our democracy. It doesn't work for our economy. It doesn't work for our national security. It doesn't work for us standing for what we believe. So that's at risk. We have an education system that is not working, I don't believe is going to work in a 21st century global society, is not preparing kids to have the skills, capabilities, confidence, understanding of self, critical thinking to understand media and information, all, all the things that we need our kids to know. And everything is at stake. And so I'm like, this is, this is gonna impact all of us, you guys. Like, so I, I'm just like, you know, everyone can think, well, here's my trajectory. I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll live in a gated community. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, we are all interconnected and we cannot be well unless we're all well. And so the opportunity when you're early on in your career is the opportunity to say, let me go big and make the biggest contribution and, and take the biggest risks I can take. And the truth is there is, I, teaching is among the greatest acts of leadership because you learn so much. You are the CEO of a classroom and it's actually true. It's the hardest job I've had teaching of all the jobs I've had. That is still the hardest job because you're learning, hey, you have to have a goal. You learn how to use data. You have to communicate with kids, with administrators, with other educators. You have to connect with families. You have to learn how to think on your feet. You have to be adaptable. You have to focus and learn how to stay focused on what you have control over. You don't have control over a lot of things that frustrate the heck out of you. And then you can't quit. You're like, no, because I don't have control over that. Well, I can't do it. No, no, no. The real leader says, okay, what do I have control over? And how am I going to overcome this? And you always find the path. Those are extraordinary skills to learn, and you almost feel like you can do anything after you've taught successfully. Um, and so for me, what I would say is like, I don't think there's a greater way to create impact. And at a time where we need leadership and innovation in the system, like desperately working alongside kids and families and other educators to create a path forward. This is the time. We need pioneers. You're like, I like to create, I like to build, go teach. We need your leadership and energy in the classroom. 
And then you're having an immediate impact with kids who really matter so desperately. Um, and you hear so much, especially in kids in low-income communities, when you ask, what was the thing that got you on a different trajectory? The data supports this. By and large, a teacher. A teacher. One teacher in this grade said this to me, did this to me, expected this of me. So it really does matter. Um, and then you're in the arena. You're not being theoretical. You know, it's, I love consultants. They've helped us a lot. But you're not, you're doing the work. You're like fighting the fight. You're having, you're in the middle of all of the inequity. Teaching, that's ground zero for understanding how all these systems come and collide together in a kid's life. And then how you make sense of that and how you begin to figure out how do I want to contribute to that for the rest of my life. So I just, you know, we need purpose-driven leaders to say yes and say, I can do this. And no, you're part of a community that like is all in for kids. I don't know anything more inspirational. That's why I've stayed with TFA all these years. The people who I'm like, we'll stop at nothing. And that, that's what's energizing is that you have people that say yes. You know, when you have a big problem, many times you're like, well, I don't know how we're gonna, we can't do it. There's all these constraints. And to be around a community that says, well, what, what, what would it take? What if you didn't have a choice? What would it take to actually do that? And then you do that. And then you get to the next thing that you do. So um, that's, that's my pitch is we need our leaders to serve and be part of the solution now more than ever. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty compelling pitch. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Other, other questions? After listening to that pitch and like reflecting on the kind of chat you've had today, we obviously have our own issues within education within the US. Are there other places outward of the United States that you look to for inspiration, influence? You know, the world is dealing with all these changes. So just like where have you found models that either seem to be working or working well, or you know, kind of what's your sense on that? Yeah, you know, there's there's so much about, you know, people talk about Finland and these other s countries that are high performing and um I feel like we've tried so hard to say, how can we contextualize that into our, our context? Um, often what you have, the scale are just different. The inequities and the histories are quite different, although there are similarities. Um, I do think there's a lot to learn from that, like as an example. Um, but I, it's, I'm like, I'm optimistic. But on this, I'm just like, I don't know how to do this. So in certain countries that are extremely high performing, the teaching profession is is held in very high regard. It's like one of the most important roles. They're treated as such, paid as such, all the things. Um, and it's also, it's more, it's, it is rigorous. And the way into teaching is, is, um, is more selective and narrow. So they have like two or three ways that you could actually enter the teaching profession. And that's it. Here we have unlimited ways. You know, you have schools of ed, you have tons of altered programs. We're an altered program. There are many that are decent, some that are great, and many that are very bad. Um, and that's just reality. And, and so you, and, and, there's, and there's no way to control this. And it's become in many ways a business too. You know, this is how business, schools are surviving, you know, and so the, the incentives are just not aligned. And we haven't started with from a place of, um, what's the purpose? of learning and education in a 21st century global society. That is where my interest is, which I'm not seeing enough. Your question is interesting, but we're not, I'm trying to study like where are places that are really working to reinvent, because the world has to reinvent the way we've thought about schooling, which starts with asking the fundamental question, what's the purpose of an education? And you're like, if that's the purpose, what are the outcomes that you're trying to go after? And then what are the objectives and learning? And how do you then design yourself to do that? And you start to quickly realize, you would design the whole thing quite differently um, because kids are bored out of their mind. Chronic absenteeism is like a serious problem right now. You all, like 40% of kids in the two largest systems in America were not showing up to school. 40%, um, over 40% last year in LA and New York. Um, anyway, all to say that I'm interested in figuring out how do we, we, we do this in a more coherent way and able to apply some of these learnings that are real and we've just struggled to figure out how to do this in our context. And I think now I'm fundamentally focused on a different question that I'm starting to learn what other countries are, are thinking about on how to 
make the transformation and reinvention real. Thank you. Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you so much again for being here. I know in some earlier talks you mentioned about this need to rebuild your culture within TFA and the importance of transparency, um, and especially in terms of equity, how, how crucial culture is. I think specifically post-COVID and in post-2022, I'm sorry, 2020, um, and the, the mental health toll it's taken on students and educators, how do you speak about mental health as a culture? Because um, I feel like with teachers, there really isn't any room to have mental health time, so how do you navigate that? Um, and to cultivate, and, or what do you recommend for building a culture that supports um, your educators, your staff in, in modes of crisis? It's a really good question. I mean, this question of wellness, you all, I think is, a, is one that we can't shy away from. You know, I hear people talking about, um, well, for kids to learn, we got to deal with mental wellness, and that's a pathway to learning. What I've come to believe is like wellness is an end in and of itself. Um, and this generation, I think, is teaching us a lot about that. Like, that's just something that folks want to have and, and nurture. And I think there's a lot to learn from that and, and really important. I was struck. I just learned that the most popular course at Yale University is a happiness course, freshman course. And at Stanford, it's like build your life course that is all about integrating work and wellness. And so this isn't going away. Like, the need and the desire for people to have just overall wellness is, is, I think, a priority that organizations have to figure out, our cultures have to figure out. Um, so at Teach for America, this is something that we really focused on. We have to, as we are also supporting educators. So through COVID, we went to a, a policy and structure where we had unlimited PTO um, that we've moved to. And there are, there's research that says organizations that move to unlimited PTO actually have people take less time off than, you know, really take time off as they needed. So we've been managing that really well, and we have not seen that pattern in the organization where it really just gave people freedom to be able to take care of themselves and have the flexibility to do that and us working to figure out how to make it work while taking care of our people as a number one priority. Um, for our teachers, we do things like, and this, these are all, this is a Band-Aid, I would say, not a, 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 we have to like take on the real systemic issues, which I think are the conditions really in, in schools. But um, for our core members, we partner with BetterHelp. Um, so all of our teachers get free access to counseling um, via text, Zoom, um, and it is highly used. I mean, it was shocking the numbers. I think last year there was over 100,000 texts exchanged and you know, about a third of our core had accessed the services within the first few months of, of becoming core members. So there's just a need for all of this. And then in our own practice for teachers, really focused, we have a whole like learning um, domain around social emotional wellness, trauma-informed teaching, um, how to create the conditions for you as an adult to be able to be emotionally available and able to manage you know, your own wellness, because if you're not doing that, you certainly can't show up for your kids. And so we do a lot of work on that with our training and support model that's, and there's a lot more to do. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. We're working to get a lot more feedback from our own teachers about what more we can be doing. And I will say the financial piece to this is connected to wellness. You know, there's different types of wellness that people need safety, you know, financial. And so us understanding those different dimensions, what we have control over that we can influence. And then of course, advocating more broadly for real change, um, like the, on the teacher compensation piece, that's something that, you know, I'm writing about, we're advocating for on the Hill and in our state legislators offices as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we, we have time for one last question. And then if there are other questions, will you be able to answer them yeah. if people come up? I will hang out. Okay. All right. So please. Thank you so much for being here. I'm not just a fan of like who you are and what you represent, but like Teach for America as a whole, I very much align with the mission. I'm a Teach for America Houston 2019 alum. I recruited for Teach for America. I currently still help onboard core members. So I'm like, I've seen all the facets of what the organization does. So. Teach for America not only is giving core members the opportunity to like be really good teachers and be effective, but I feel I gathered a lot more uh, like other skills. I was exposed to DEI and identity work for the first time in my life by being in TFA. I got policy, advocacy, and community organizing skills. So my question is, how can business schools ensure 
underrepresented minorities or people of color are not always given or feel like they have the responsibility to educate students who are part of the dominant culture. And what I mean by that is like white folks that show conflicting behaviors such as racism, implicit bias and discrimination. How can like business schools maybe in not just faculty administration or other students share that responsibility to educate the community as a whole? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> so thank you for, for all that you've done and your contributions. Um, you know, what I would say is, I was talking about TFA's journey earlier on DEI and a commitment to racial equity. And there's just, everyone's on a journey. And the question is like the consciousness of where you are in the journey. And um, one of the big lessons that we've learned at Teach for America over time is DEI and racial equity, which is like a, co a connection and inclusion of all and creating conditions where all can make their greatest contribution. Um, and be be able to thrive is really important. And those are different things. And so for a long time, the majority of our time, TFA is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. And, and mostly our biggest effort has been on, on diversity and what people, and for us, it's racial and ethnic diversity and socioeconomic diversity. And that is very important. And I think all of us would agree with that. And, and the research shows how important that is for kids to you know, have all sorts of diversity, but especially kids of color to be able to see themselves and their teachers is really important. Um, and, so, and so that's where we focus. What I was explaining to folks earlier is the thing that doesn't work is you have a system that stood up. You have a way of doing work. You have the cultural norms dominant norms that exist in any culture, that you know, they're true no matter where we go. And some people will be like, this is very familiar. I know exactly what to do next. I know exactly how to speak to you. I know exactly how to, you know, how to write the right thing to communicate what I needed to you. Um, I know how to get into action given what you just said. I can read between the lines. I know what to do. What is true too is that others who have not grown up in that kind of environment or culture is not intuitive. In fact, some of it is like counter to, they're like, wait, that's not what I would go do. Why are people doing that? I would actually, I would go do this instead. Um, and there's not enough room for all to be able to actually fit in, have a place or feel like they can make their greatest contribution or say, actually, this is how I see it totally differently and feel comfortable to say that that would be recognized and valued here because it might be pretty shocking or confusing to most of the people in the room, but folks understanding like, oh, maybe I do need to see this differently or I'm, I'm so comfortable in how I'm operating that I don't understand a, the different viewpoint here. And that's the lesson that we've taken and have been working to improve and, and have more transparency and understanding on creating a culture and the conditions by which there is true inclusion, true belonging, um, where there is an understanding that people with different experiences are going to bring different expectations to a room and that we're curious about that um, and that we understand that kind of diversity leads us to better outcomes, leads to better decisions. Um, but there has to be a consciousness to that in order to even understand what I'm saying here, which I don't know if everyone's following, but you actually have to have a consciousness and understanding to value this and know to look for it and, and know to want to create those kinds of conditions. And so what it means is that folks are self-aware of the dynamics going on and what you're contributing or what you're not contributing, what others are contributing. And so that is very cultural. That is very um, embedded in the systems and processes that are built in an organization um, that I think have to constantly be reexamined and asked, is this creating belonging and inclusion for everybody, because you want everybody to be able to make their greatest contributions. Thank you. OK, well, Elisa, thank you thank so you. much uh, you. For, for spending the time with, with our community and for modeling for our community what it means to be a leader of consequence. It's been fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.